I'm going to take a moment and try to characterize the, uh, the fighting during the Great War. Uh, on the Western Front, uh, the traditional description is uh, one of uh, immobile warfare, very little movement, um, trench warfare. Uh, and you can, uh, you can see the uh, cause of this by looking at the map here, of the Western Front. You can see the trenches extend all the way to the English Channel in the northeast, or the northwest, I'm sorry. And they extend all the way to the, uh, the Swiss Alps in the southeast. Uh, both armies, both the Germans and the Allies, are continually trying to flank one another at the beginning of this war. And so both armies' lines simply be become further and further extended and finally reaching the, uh, the point that you see here on the map. Once the lines reach the channel in the Swiss Alps, then uh, there are very little options left for the generals. They begin to rely on these massive frontal assaults. Uh, you can't flank the enemy anymore. The, uh, the Allied left is protected by the English Channel. The Allied right is protected by the Swiss Alps. And then just flip it around. Uh, the German right is protected by the English Channel and the German left is protected by the Swiss Alps. This leaves one option, frontal assaults. Therefore, we have um, casualties uh, in, in, in astronomical numbers in this war. Uh, I think it's fair to say that the general's tactics never caught up with the, um, with the technology that's being used. Uh, the generals act as if this is still the Napoleonic times. Um, they don't take into account the barbed wire, uh, the machine guns, the poisonous gas, and they're never really able to overcome this. So we have uh, just astronomical casualties uh, with these massive frontal assaults across what is called um, no man's land. This is the land between the trenches. Uh, a chicken can't live out here once the artillery and the machine guns open up. And men are expected to cross no man's land to assault the enemy's lines. Well, the, these assaults rarely ever even reach the enemy's lines. They're beaten back. Um, this is a deadly, deadly type of warfare uh, with very little movement, uh, little mobility, the inability to flank. Uh, and these trenches stay in place for four years on the Western Front. Uh, there's some shifting. Um, Germans gain a small advantage, or the Allies may gain a small advantage uh, here and there. But for the most part, this is a static, immobile war. In the uh, Eastern Front, the Germans have more success, a great deal more mobility. Um, Russian armies begin to, uh, by 1916, 1917, Russian armies begin to disintegrate. Uh, the average Russian soldier would have uh, more opportunity to get water, food, boots, ammunition uh, from a dead German in the field in front of him than he would getting it from his own supply, from his own government. Uh, the Tsar's government is uh, losing credibility, losing its ability to function. The people's uh, faith in the Tsar has evaporated by 1917. And indeed, Tsar Nicholas II will abdicate the throne in 1917. Um, most of Western Russia is overrun by the Germans. The Baltic countries, uh, uh, what we know today of is Poland, uh, other parts of Eastern Europe, and a uh, large swath of Western Russia gobbled up by the Germans. So the Germans have a great deal more success militarily in the East than they do in the West. Now, by 1917, uh, we're stuck in the West in, these trench, in this trench warfare, and the German general staff look around and ask themselves, is there any way to get Russia completely out of this war? Uh, if we could get Russia out of the war, then we could bring all those troops from the Eastern Front back to the Western Front and crush the Allies and win the war. They see that Russia is already entering a period of political chaos with the Tsar losing credibility. They know that um, a Russian revolutionary, uh, Vladimir Lenin, who is living in exile, Lenin li living, I believe, in Switzerland at the time, publishing his uh, radical paper. Uh, we talked about Lenin when we talked about the economic uh, justification for imperialism. Now, the German general staff get the 
notion that perhaps they could approach Lenin and make him an offer that he can't refuse. That is, to take him back to Russia. Now, Lenin, of course, has the lifelong ambition of toppling the Tsar. He's a dedicated Marxist. His uh, lifelong ambition is to establish a communist state in Russia. So when this offer is made by the Germans, he, uh, he leaps at this chance. Uh, the Germans put Lenin in a protected train and take him to St. Petersburg, I believe it's St. Petersburg, and drop him off. This is in April of 1917. Lenin, within six months, uh, takes over the Russian government. You can't make this stuff up. Uh, the Germans had rolled the dice on this, and uh, it turns out to their advantage. And indeed, Lenin promises, had promised to withdraw Russia from the war, and he does. He signs a treaty with the Germans, uh, removing Russia from the war and giving up large swaths of Western Russia to the Germans, uh, surrendering Russian influence in the Balkans, for instance, and in Poland. Uh, so Lenin pulls Russia out of the war in 1917. Now, the Germans began bringing all those troops on the Russian front back to the French front. This is their opportunity to win the war. But they compound um, the this, this situation. They, while it worked out well for them that the Russians withdrew, at the same time the Germans are practicing unlimited submarine warfare in the Atlantic. Uh, they were attempting to starve out the British. British being an island people, uh, the Germans are using their U-boats or submarines to sink Allied shipping and to try to starve the British or uh, at least to pressure them out of the war. Well, the German unlimited submarine warfare begins to sink American ships as well. Now, in 1915, uh, the German subs sunk, uh, I believe it was called the USS Lus Lusitania, uh, the American government protested this. The Germans promised they would cease this uh, submarine warfare against Allied shipping. Uh, but then the Germans resumed it uh, once Russia withdrew because this is their opportunity to win the war. So they resume unlimited submarine warfare. This is what will bring the United States into the war in 1917. So the Germans managed to eliminate a major combatant, a major opponent, the Russians, at the same time, they bring in an even stronger enemy, the Americans. Um, to add insult to injury, the Germans apparently uh, uh, negotiated with the Mexicans, uh, telling the Mex Mexicans if they would launch a war against the United States along our southern border, that Germany would support Mexico in its quest to regain all that territory lost in, uh, in the Mexican session in, 1840, in the 1840s. Uh, this includes California, Arizona, New Mexico, uh, a large swath of the western United States. This, of course, infuriated the American people. How dare the Germans meddle in our affairs like this, uh, trying to provoke Mexico to go to war against us. So that was sort of an emotional topping uh, to this incident, but the, the primary cause of uh, the American entry into the war is unlimited submarine warfare, the sinking of Allied shipping, U.S. shipping in particular. The, uh, the final year of the war, the Germans will launch massive assaults on the Allied lines, but by this time the Americans have joined the French and the British, and these German assaults fail. Uh, the tide will begin turning uh, the other way now. The Allies will begin to make some advances and encroach more and more on German lines. Uh, on, uh, what was it, uh, November the 11th? What, what was the old saying? The 11th day, the 11th hour, the 11th month. Uh, the German Empire surrender, surrenders and the Great War ends. Uh, but remember, when the German Empire surrenders in November of 1918, the German armies are still in Russia. Uh, the German armies are still in France and in Belgium. Um, this is important because it will have a huge impact on German uh, domestic opinion at home. So I've just briefly characterized the war here for you. Uh, in our next session we'll talk about the Treaty of Versailles and the, uh, uh, the settlement that ends the war and redraws the map of Europe and the uh, Middle East. Thanks.